I think I already said it once. I think I say it twice every service, but I'll say good morning again. Good morning. <laughs> Maybe sometime I'll think of something else to say. Oh, well, today, uh, read the sign, as we saw last week's bulletin. Uh, we're going to talk about the shack today. Yes. So I, I want to take a quick poll. This isn't, I just want to get an idea of how many people know about the shack. I'm not having Teresa write down names as we <laughs> Yes, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> but who has heard of the shack, either as a book or the movie? Okay. And who has actually read it or started reading it? Okay. Okay. So anyway, that's what I wanted to kind of figure out. Okay, what's the level of what's going on here with the shack? Um, Radio shack? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is random <laughs> uh, The Shack. It was a book that came out here. Uh, oh boy, it's been almost ten years now. Uh, it came out. Um, it sold over twenty million copies. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty successful book, and it's uh, it's a fiction. It's a, it's a what they call it Christian fiction book. Um, and the premise of the story is. Uh, Mac, the, uh, the head guy, McKenzie, uh, they, it starts out that they had uh, him and his family around on this camping trip in the wilderness, um, and uh, they're out hiking around, and they lost their daughter, and, and then, lo and behold, they found that the daughter had been kidnapped by a serial killer and, and, and murdered, and they found her in this shack. Um, then they fast forward a few years, and, they, and, they, and they, he talked to me of the, the, the grief uh, you know, and that they're still processing over the death of their daughter. Um, and Mac feels led to go back to the shack they found him um, and spend a week in there. When he gets there, you know, the door opens and, you know, he encounters three people, uh, three human beings. Uh, a, a black middle-aged woman who calls herself Papa. Uh, a middle-aged uh, Middle Eastern guy who calls himself Jesus. Um, and a third Asian woman who calls himself Sarayu, who's also, who's also the Holy Spirit. Um, and he spends the weekend dialoguing with them uh, about, you know, about, you know, his faith. And, and, and I mean, it's a whole book is centered on the, the Holy Trinity. I mean, it's Max interaction with God, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, um, it, you know, it was... Took off on sales, obviously. I mean, it's over 20 million copies. Um, problem is, it does have a lot of doctrinal issues um, and core, foundational doctrinal issues. Not like, oh, the Baptists have an issue with this one, and the, the Reformed people have an issue with this one. No, the the issues are the core of the Christian faith, and we're going to go over those. Uh, but first, I know you know a lot of heard uh, the discussion over people through you know through the years to say this book's been out for a while. I have a chance to talk with a few people about it as it's come up, and they say, "Well, what's the big deal? It's just fiction. Why why are we looking at it so hard? Why why, why are we you know why are you saying all this bad stuff about it? it's just a work of fiction?" And a lot of times they, they point to you know C.S. Lewis uh, wrote uh, the, the Chronicles of Narnia, and they they point that. Uh, you know, what, what about Aslan? You know, I, you know, I'm good about Kirk and Narnia. Aslan is the kind of the Christ-like figure. He's the lion um, that kind of you know, depicts Jesus in the cross-like manner. And in that movie, you know, why are we, you know, getting mad about Jesus being depicted as a lion? Well, I mean, C.S. Lewis is clearly an allegory. I mean, Aslan never refers to himself as Jesus or the Christ. He's a Christ-like figure. And um, C.S. Lewis said he, he, he wanted to see what it would look like in a parallel universe of what Christ would do. And, and thus, they have the kids going through a wardrobe into a parallel universe. It's purely allegory, but we can get a lot of stuff out of it as a Christ-like figure. Um, and further, in the series, God is never represented. Uh, they only only think Azad refers to God and God the Father as the emperor over the sea. And they, they never depict, there's never a godlike figure, only a Christ-like figure. And, and the, the Holy Spirit is never really dealt with in his books either. So the argument of, you know, 
what C.S. Lewis is doing is okay. Why is it okay in the shack? Is back is in the shack. You have three humans claiming to be God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. There's not much allegory there. That's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's still fiction, but it's not allegory. You can't give them that allegorical license. And they say, well, it's just imagery. Well, even if it's imagery, if you call yourself Christian, shouldn't everything you do be along the biblical guidelines? You know, if you listen on the radio, if someone calls himself a, a, a Christian music artist, you listen to Christian music, and you think the song would conform to what the Bible says, right? And so you, you know, the same thing with Christian books. If it calls itself a Christian book, it should conform to biblical standards, to biblical teaching, you know? And I know there's, there's a wide range of Christian fiction out there. I've, I've read a lot that it's really not really a Christian book. It's a, a good book, and then it doesn't have any gross or sexual or bad language, and it may include God at the end, you know? And I don't have a problem with that because it's not dealing with doctrine and theology. It's just a good book. And then there's others, you know, there's a lot of romance, you know, and I know those are extremely popular. You know, Jeanette Oak and uh, Beverly, uh, I forget her name, but they read that kind of thing. The, 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 the Settler's Time, the romance, and those are fine because they're focused on, you know, just your relationship with God. They're not dealing with the Holy Trinity throughout the entire book. Uh, so it's just a good read. Uh, but they conform to biblical teachings on that committee because they don't really go into a lot. But this book does heavily go into theology, so we must look at it. And then also, as the author says, it's fiction. And he's saying, you know, and, and I was listening to you know, recordings and interviews by the author, you know, him dialoguing with people that were trying to hold him, ask him, why are you teaching this? And he kept saying, oh, it's just imagery. It's just imagery. You know, it's just fiction. Why are we making a big deal out of it? The thing is, are you treating it as fiction? Because a fictional book, you read up, oh, hey, that was a good read. You put it down and be like, okay, that was a good story, right? Is the author treating it like that? Look at the other books that he's published. I don't know if you can see it. We have a study guide that the author has put out to go through a fictional book. He says, why, well, why, why are we holding such, why are we holding it to the Bible so hard? Then we have a, a devotional book, 365 days of devotionals from a fictional book. Then we have this, who's not, it wasn't written by the author, but the, the author wrote the foreword to it, saying he's endorsing it, and you can't see, I wish you could see a little better, it says, The Shack Revisited. There is more going on here than you ever dared to dream. I don't think the author is treating this as fiction we should just enjoy. This is fiction that he's trying to get to change people's lives. And if that we need to look at it. We can't just give it a, a, an allegorical fictional license and say, okay, you're good to know. If they're publishing study guides and devotionals, we need to go to the Bible. <laughs> so now, hopefully that establishes why we need to. This isn't just any other fictional book. I've read a lot of fiction. I love to read. You know, some of it's good, some of it's bad. I don't always hold it to the biblical account because what is it trying to tell me? If it's just a good story, Having a good story, let it pass. Yeah. But if the author is obviously wanting us to dive into it more seriously, then we have to look at it. So I'm going to stick to four areas of theological issues. Um, there's a lot more. Um, to a point, I'm going to give you a lot of names of people that have come out against it. So I, if you're wanting more information, I, I strongly urge you to just Google. You know, that name I give you in the shack, and you'll be able to find the article that they put out or the interview they did. Uh, so you can read the whole thing. Um, and they go into a lot more detail uh, on, on this. But I'm going to stick to the four areas. Well, the four areas that I think are pretty foundational to uh, just about any denomination in Christianity. The Trinity. Who God is. Remember in, remember in apologetics class when it was on Wednesdays, you know, if you're the, the number one thing you need to ask when, when someone says, yeah, I believe in God, is who is God to you? That is very foundational. A 
testimony. That's why the Jehovah's Witness deny the Trinity of Jesus. The Mormons call themselves Christians, but their God is way different from our God. Yeah. And so we have to define God, first and foremost. Then well, what's their view of Scripture? You know, how, how, how much do they hold on to the Bible? Sin, that's a very good thing to know of. What, what is teaching about sin and salvation, the gospel message? So we're going to look at each of those. So first and foremost, we'll start off with a depiction of the Trinity. God the Father portrayed as a black woman who later magically transforms into an older, gray-haired male with a ponytail. Now, before I get into this, I know they're going to talk about females and, and races, but this has nothing to do with, with the value of men versus men, uh, you know, gender or, or uh, race, equality, things like this. is just what the Bible says versus what the book is teaching. So please don't take me uh, on any... <laughs> Grounds that way. This is just purely what I'm going in what the Bible says versus what the book says. So the first kind of issue is is, is a black woman who called herself Papa. This in this day and age of gender identity, gender equality, transgender people want to change their gender in real life. Is it really helpful that a Christian book has a woman calling herself Papa? And furthermore. Nowhere in the Bible is God ever referred to in the feminine. It also says true that God is neither male nor female. But the fact is, whenever he's referred to, is always with a masculine pronoun or a masculine verb applied to it. Never in the female. That's pretty, pretty, good, pretty right, right there. For, and more than that, Big issues even portraying God. John 6. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he is from God. He has seen the Father. Only Jesus has seen the Father. 1 Timothy 6, 16. Who alone, talking about God, the Father, has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. We're not even, we can't even see God. Maybe we have the incarnation of Jesus to help us relate, but God is something that we're not supposed to see, God the Father. That is a major issue right there. If, you know, no matter what race or gender they portray God as on the film, not only is it now in a book, it's going to be where people that go to see the movie are going to see someone portraying God, who Scripture plainly sees no one has ever seen or can see. Jesus. Well, I'll actually say I don't have much issue with, with him with Jesus. Yeah, they portray him as a, as a kind of a middle-aged, Middle Eastern man. Well, that probably Jesus. <laughs> and they say he had, he had a tool belt. Well, yeah, Jesus was a worker. So I have no problem with that. Oh, and I, oh it's like a quick detour. So I, I forgot to say a couple of good things. I really do want to say about it. Is... It deals with the problem of evil a lot. And it actually does a pretty good job of wrestling with the problem of evil with a, with a good God. In that regards, I'll say that's a good book you know, for someone who may be really struggling with that. Um, it also deals a lot with relational and God's love. It does some good things. Um, but those, like on your doctrinal tier of what's more important, those are down here. What we're talking about today is above that. So hopefully you can see that. So Jesus in the book, I, I have really no qualms with. I have the stuff that Paul Young has him say, but as he's depicted, no, no big problems. Then the Holy Spirit. There's an Asian woman called Sarayu. Well, the problem is, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit never appears in a person. A dove was a wind, this fire at Pentecost. Never as a person, as a spirit. So those are the major problems right there, just how they're depicted on screen. The other thing he talks about is he addresses hierarchy within the Trinity. Here's a quote from the book. Uh, I think this is, this is Papa talking. He says, the Trinity are, are a circle of relationship, not a chain of command or a great chain of being. Hierarchy would make no sense among us. So you think that God must relate inside hierarchy like you do, but we do not. 
Is that scriptural, saying there's no hierarchy among the Trinity? I am the one, this is Jesus speaking, I am the one who bears witness about myself that the Father who sent me bears witness about me. I have not condemned him not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Seems like there's some hierarchy going on there. 1 Corinthians 11, by which I understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Hierarchy. And by saying there's no hierarchy in the Trinity, looking at this verse, he, he's actually attacking the very foundation of family. If you say, oh, there's no hierarchy, then he's saying there's no head of a family that the, that the male is the father is supposed to be. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 through 28. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, <laughs> Daniel because it's kind of hard. When all things are subjected to him, God, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him. You put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. There's so plainly a hierarchy. You have God the Father, then you have the Son. I know we have verses up here about the, the, the Holy Spirit being subordinate to Jesus because Jesus sent the Spirit to be our helper. And this is core to the Trinity, who God is. Another thing that says, Jesus uh, in the shaft says, in fact, we are submitted to you in the same way. What? God submitting to man? What? I, I don't, there's zero scriptural support. I, I have nothing scriptural put up there. It's just wrong. You know, it's just wrong. Haven't you seen the wounds on Papa too? I didn't understand them. How could he? For love. He chose the way of the cross because he's saying that God the Father suffered on the cross when Jesus was there. Some major issues there. Only Jesus was incarnate. God the Father was not incarnate. And suffering is a form of change. We'd have to say at some point God the Father did not have the scars. And at some point, went through the suffering and now changed to have scars. The problem is, does God change? Nope. I, the Lord, change not from Malachi. There is no shadow of change with him, James 1.17. God remains the same. If you look at Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. God, the Father, did not die on the cross. That would mean God died. That would be kind of a major issue. Traditions. Okay. So, got there. So, Trinity issues. Your key. How are they portraying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? How, how is he talking about the relationship within the Trinity? It's very key to our foundational faith. How we function within the church is within some sort of hierarchy. How we function with the families, some sort of structure. And he's tearing that all down. Next. The Shack's view on scripture from the book. In seminary, Mac had been taught that God had completely stopped any overt communication with moderns, preferring to have them only listen to and follow sacred scripture. Properly interpreted, of course, God's voice had been reduced to paper. And even that paper had to be moderated and deciphered by the proper authorities and intellects. Nobody wants God in a box, just in a book, and especially an expensive one bound in leather with gilt edges. Or was that gilt edges? What's Paul's young view of Scripture? Very low view of Scripture. That should be very alarming. We get to have moderated and ciphered by the properties, authorities, and intellects. You read your Bible, you can understand you know, 95% of it. Yeah, there's those tough passages where you get together and talk that out. But you don't need someone to moderate and decipher for it. You can read it yourself. What does the Bible say about Scripture? All Scripture is breathed out by God and prophet for teaching, for reproof, what we're doing today, for correction. And for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through our endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. 
He keeps talking about in this book that a pretty much experience is more valuable than scripture. What does scripture say is our hope and our encouragement? Scripture, not our experience. Man, the shacks, if you want sin, at that Papa stopped her preparations and turned towards Mac. He could see a deep sadness in her eyes. I am not who you think I am, Mackenzie. I don't mean to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment, devouring you from the inside. It is not my purpose to punish it. It's my joy to cure it. Well, I'll, I will say that's an accurate statement. Right there. God does delight when people turn from sin and he can cure it. That's an accurate statement. All this is not. God hates sin. For the wages of sin is death. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Sin is serious. It's not something we just sweep under the rug. It's very serious. Honey, I've never placed an expectation on you or anyone else. Does God expect anything from us? You shall be holy, for I am holy. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Salvation. Jesus said, those who love me come from every system that exists. Hopefully red flags are starting to go up. They are Buddhists or Mormons, Baptists or Muslims, Many who are not part of any Sunday morning or religious institution. Some are bankers and bookings, Americans and Iraqis, Jews and Palestinians. I have no desire to make them Christians. But I do want to join them in their transformation into sons and daughters of my papa. Does that mean all roads lead to you? Not at all. Most roads don't lead anywhere. What it does mean is I will travel any road to find you. Some of that's true. There is some truth in that, I have no desire to make them Christians. It should be very alarming. And they are Buddhists or Mormons, Baptists or Muslims. What is, the, what is uh, oh, Max speaking back to Jesus, says the whole world, in speaking of you can be saved, Max says the whole world, you mean those who believe in you, right? And God replies back, correcting him, the whole world. So they don't have to believe in Jesus? What does the scripture say? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There is only one way. Papa, in Jesus I have forgiven all humans for their sins against me. All the prophets testify about him that anyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So what comes first? Believe. Then you receive forgiveness. Jesus paid the price for everyone. <clears throat> and that gift of forgiveness is out there. But it's not already all forgiven. Hence the final judgment in the coming revelation. Acts 8, 22, repent of this witness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. He has not forgiven everybody. So those are the four main doctrinal issues. And in a book that has sold 20 million people, uh, copies. Now I was looking at reviews on Amazon, like people saying, this is better than the Bible. It's been more life-changing to me than anything I've read before. It should be very alarming. Now, I have, this is where I have some quotes from other very noted uh, theologians, uh, you know, uh, uh, smart people around the country. Um, and so if you want more detailed information, uh, write down their name and Google it with the shack, and you'll be able to find their articles online. <coughs> Chuck Colson. The Bible, it seems, is just one among many equally valid ways in which God reveals himself. 
And we are told the Bible is not about rules and principles. It is about relationship. Sadly, the author fails to show that the relationship with God must be built on the truth of who he really is, not on our reaction to a sunset or a painting. Yes, we can experience God and be in the mind like, wow, God, I see your beauty in the sunset and the beauty in painting, but that's not where we find out who he is. Find out who he is in the scriptures. Albert Moeller, who is the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, the theology of the shack is not incidental to the story. Indeed, at most points, the narrative seems mainly to serve as a structure for the dialogues. And the dialogues reveal a theology that is unconventional at best and undoubtedly heretical in certain respects. Norman Geisler, a very good uh, scholar out there, the shack may do well for many in engaging the current culture, but not without compromising Christian truth. The book may be psychologically helpful to many who read it, but is doctrinally harmful to all who are exposed to it. It has a false understanding of God, the Trinity, the person and work of Christ, the nature of man, the institution of family and marriage, and the nature of the gospel. Randy Alcorn, he's actually met with the author quite a bit. He lives close to the author and has, uh, he got one of the first printings and he still, I mean, close friend of the author, published this. I think the book would have been better served the church 30 years ago when there was so much more legalism and too little talk of God's grace and forgiveness. Ironically, though, there's still some legalism. There is also significantly less knowledge of Scripture and spiritual discernment and concern for orthodoxy. That means some people, perhaps many, will fail to recognize and filter out the book's theological errors, and therefore be vulnerable to embracing them, even if unconsciously. I'm going to skip this one. This is a, everyone, everyone read the uh, uh, Green Eggs and Ham? Fred Sanders is a theologian with a great sense of humor. H have you read the Shack of Back? Have you read this paper back? Would you give it to your friends? Would you spoil how it ends? I have read the Shack of Mac. I have read this paperback. I would not give it to my friends. I might just spoil how it ends. Do you like Max Trinity? Do you like Max Persons 3? Did you like how Jesus talked? Did you like that water walk? I did not like Max Trinity. I did not like Max Persons 3. I did not like how Jesus talked. I did not like the water walk. That Mac and Shack, that Mac and Shack. I do not like that Mac and Shack. <laughs> do you like it for your heart? Do you like it for some art? I did not like it for my heart. I do not like it as some art. Not in the shack. No paperback. Not in my heart. And not as some art. I do not like the Mac and Shack. I do not like it. Take it back. <laughs> Humorous way of expressing his opinion on the book. <laughs> I've read that book quite a bit. <laughs> uh, he wrote a great book on the Trinity, though. Uh, I just totally blanked the name of it. Uh, there's an amazing book he wrote on the Trinity. Um, Rabbi Zechariah, he hasn't said much. He's trying, to, he's trying to kind of keep a middle ground, not really coming out against it or for it. <coughs> About an interview, he said, the character's clouded who God and who Christ is meant to be. If something's clouding your ability to interpret or see God in, in Christ, there's the issues. John Piper, renowned uh, Christian author, in a tweet, he put this in on tweet on Twitter, Quoting Tim Keller, the shack deconstructs the holiness and transcendence of God. Tim Keller shows the value of the Bible. So John Piper is, is standing and backing up with Tim Keller, who is a uh, Presbyterian pastor that owned the East Coast. Also, also many books he's published. So let's look at what Tim Keller put. And I think this is a long quote, but he, he put it better than I ever could. So I put it up here. And this is Tim, Tim Keller. But here's my main problem with the book. Anyone who is strongly influenced by the imaginative world of the shack will be totally unprepared for the far more multidimensional and complex God that you actually meet when you read the Bible. In the prophets, 
The reader will find a God who is constantly condemning and vowing judgment on his enemies. While the persons of the triune God of the shack repeatedly deny that sin is any offense to them. The reader of Psalm 119 is filled with delight at God's statutes, decrees, and laws. Yet the God of the Shek insists he doesn't give us any rules or, or even have any expectations of human beings. All he wants is relationship. The reader of the lives of Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and Isaiah will learn that the holiness of God makes his immediate presence dangerous or fatal to us. Some of them may counter, as you all see if you go on page 192, that because of Jesus, God is not only a God of love, making all talk of holiness, of wrath, and law obsolete. But when John, one of Jesus' closest friends, long after the crucifixion, sees the risen Christ in person on the Isle of Patmos, John fell at his feet as dead. The shack effectively deconstructs the holiness and transcendence of God. It is simply not there. In its place is unconditional love, period. The God of the shack has none of the balance, complexity of the biblical God. Half of God is not God at all. I think he put it pretty well. Put it pretty well. Well, then what should you do? The response to this. <laughs> First thing we should do is grow in your discernment of the Bible. And by, by searching your Bible. Acts 17. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if those things were true. So Paul came and told them about Jesus. Did the Bereans just go, yeah, sounds great? No. They searched the scriptures, which actually to them would have been the Old Testament. They searched to validate what Paul was telling them coincided with what scripture was saying. And that's what we need to do. We need to develop that discernment to know when we encounter something that is wrong, our, our discernment alarms start going off. You know, I wonder when we were up in Montana, you know, I, I've been a Christian for a while, but I wasn't very deep. And I was in a church shopping, this is before we were married. I keep pointing, she's not there. <laughs> uh, we, we weren't married yet. Um, and so I was going, to, some friends invited me to a church that they were going to, and I went to them and said, hey, this is kind of cool. It's, it's, I, I like the pastor. He seems to be doing all right. I went there for like a month. And you know, Katie came up to visit. And she went with me to that church service. And after that one time, she came out and says, no, we're not going. I'm like, huh? And she was, she was kind of off. She had been a Christian her whole life. She had been through a church split and seen bad pastors and bad things going in the churches. She had the discernment, and I did not. I was like, hey, it sounds good. And she was like, no, 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 no. And sure enough, my friends, they ended up leaving too. And after a while, the warning flag started getting more and more. Yeah. We have to cultivate that spirit of discernment. And that's through reading your Bible. And unfortunately, in today's world, when somebody calls itself Christian, our guards kind of come down, don't we? You know, like, I've gone and seen movies that are like obviously non-Christian. You know, especially I like to see stuff that is mainly about a biblical idea just so I can see it and go through it, you know. And like, you know, the, the movie Noah with Russell Crowe. Um, I went to that movie because I thought, I got to go, I got to see what's going on here. But man, my guard's rough. You know, I'm like, bring it, I'm ready. You know, but when we go into a Christian store or we buy Christian books, we go to a Christian movie, those guards come down. And that's how, and we just got done talking about all that discourse in times of false teachings. You know, I'm not calling Paul on the false teacher here. But the false teachings infiltrate the church, not by someone coming in with a stick saying, I'm a false teacher. I'm going to teach the wrong things. That's not how it happens. It's in small increments. 
they tell everybody, like, if you want to improve yourself, take the uh, two degree change. So if you're going this path in your life, and you want to go over there, you know, improve your life, right now you make a two degree change. It's a small change. But down the line, that's a big change from where you were going. Well, it works the opposite for going astray. If we're holding to biblical truth, and we read a book like this, and say, oh, it tickles my ears, it makes me feel good. I get a good reaction out of it. But the problem is it's not biblical. And so we make that two degree change away from the Bible. It may be only a small change now, but 10 years down the road, we have strayed more and more and more away from our biblical roots. And we cannot let that happen. We need to be in the Bible. That's why we have our Bible reading plan. We're reading through the Old Testament. We're going to read about the God of wrath, the God of justice. And we're not going to read this, this touchy feely loving God. It's a God of wrath. It's a strong God. So discern it. And once we discern it, we need to stand firm on key doctrinal beliefs. So I work the four we talked about today. Who God is, what scripture is, what is sin, what is the gospel message, what is salvation? You know, that's the nice thing about a community church. You know, we're not a, we're not a denominational church where we can get down into the weeds and cling a hold to these small things that cause division. We're a community church. We have people from all different backgrounds of faith here. That's great. Because we all agree on the gospel. We focus on the gospel and changing people's lives through the gospel. And in that gospel, we have those core faiths that we cannot waver on. We must hold firm to those. Galatians 6.10. This is Paul writing to church in Galatia. I'm astonished you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, no true gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I'll say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For I am not seeking the approval of men or of God. Or am I trying to please men? If I were to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's a pretty strong warning about distorting the gospel, which unfortunately has happened so much in American Christianity. We must stand firm on what the gospel is. Resist false teachings, even if they are good and are popular. The Shack is a prime example. 20 million copies. It's going to influence the church in a bad way. It might you know, help some unbelievers come to a better understanding. I read a few of those articles, and that's good for an unbeliever to maybe have at least start a relationship with God as long as they get some sound doctrinal teaching afterwards. But for the person's already a Christian and doesn't have the discernment, man, you're going to have some problems. And God resists them. The uh, British theologian G.K. Chesterton said, fallacies do not cease to be fallacies because, because they come fashions. Falsehoods do not change the fact that they're falsehoods, even if they're popular. All right? We must stand against it. Finally, acknowledge the holiness and majesty that God is. That is good for When we realize who God is, so, so often in American Christianity, we lower God and we raise ourselves. <coughs> and I know we have those passages where you know, Jesus Christ, Abba Father, you know, and even the use of the word Papa in the book is not bad. The problem is if that's the only aspect we look at, we're giving a pretty distorted view of God. And those are actually only a few verses compared to the rest of the Bible that show a much more mighty and holy God that we need to be separated from, you know, as far as hierarchy. When we look at the holiness of God and we look at our sin and the seriousness of it, sin is not something just to, oh, it's okay, we're not going to punish you for it, sin is upon myself. No, sin is against God, the most holy being. We must acknowledge that. So what do we do now? As we go to a time of communion, uh, we started doing a uh, responsive reading where we go back and forth in our reading. Um, 
We're going to read a passage now about the majesty and the greatness of God. Um, I was going to, does anyone know like why we have the tradition of standing when we read scripture? Respect. Yeah, honor and honor and respect for reading God's word. So standing shows, hey, I, I am showing honor and respect to that. So let's come to it now, and we can read back and forth through Isaiah 40 as we prepare for communion. 